what really happened in the Garden of Eden. Within the Genesis narrative, the Garden of Eden has talking snakes, man made from dirt, Eve made from a rib, and many other details like tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, kicking people out of the garden and, and then being found naked. All of these details, are they mythology? Are they literal history? Could there be a combination of both? Dr. Bruce Wells believes that he has pinned the tail on the donkey, so to speak, and found where this may have come from in Babylon. That this story may have originated in the 5th, 6th century BCE, in the time of the captivity in Babylon. We address questions such as Adam is Israel or various theories about what may have happened. What was the serpent and the stomping, the bruising of the hill of Adam and Eve or Eve's seed versus that of the serpents? All of these mysterious symbols and possible metaphors, can they be deciphered? You tell us what you think. Check out the video. Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. Today, I have another special guest. I'm excited to discuss the topic of the Garden of Eden. Maybe you've never understood this story. We've all heard of it, but maybe we don't quite understand when and where and what's the context and what does it mean? Genesis 2 through 3. So my special guest today is Dr. Bruce Wells. Welcome to Myth Vision. Thank you, Derek. Glad to be here. Thank you. I saw your uh, interview over at my friend's Digital Hammurabi, Dr. Joshua Bowen and Megan Lewis. They interviewed you. It was a fantastic interview. And I hope to delve into similar content today. Maybe we touch on things that weren't mentioned. Uh, let's have some fun. And before we do, I want to go ahead and let everyone know, Dr. Bruce Wells is an associate professor of Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Texas, where he specializes in the study of Hebrew Bible and ancient Near East. And if you will, Dr. Wells, this is your first time appearing on my program. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? And I'm going to surf through your books to get people acquainted to see some of the literature they can go down in the description and purchase to read up on themselves. Sure. Um, my first book was a revised version of my PhD dissertation uh, called The Law of Testimony and the Pentateuchal Codes. I was very interested in the justice system in the ancient Near East, how they handled legal disputes, how they set up uh, court systems and things like that. And I looked at uh, the issue of testimony and how that's used in trial records throughout the ancient Near East, particularly how testimony is referred to in biblical texts. Uh, and I try to make the argument that the Neo-Assyrian and Neo-Babylonian material in particular helps to shed light on some of the laws in the Old Testament regarding testimony, how many witnesses you can have when witnesses have to testify and what you do about false witnesses. Um, then shortly after that, um, I collaborated with Raymond Westbrook on this uh, small book, Everyday Law and Biblical Israel, an introduction. And it looks at different issues in the legal system of ancient Israel from the perspective of a legal historian. So we look at contracts, status, uh, possession of land and ownership, uh, litigation, those sorts of things, crime and torts, uh, not so much from a religious perspective, but using the categories that a legal historian would use to analyze what's going on in that legal system. Uh, so we think the book is kind of unique in that way. And it's a very short read. Uh, and I think it's a very interesting read, of course. Um, and then two years ago, two other scholars and I came out with a book um, that's a uh, much harder read. <laughs> it's a 700 pages, um, but I th think it's full of interesting stuff. Um, we published some new documents that hadn't been published before in here from Babylonia. The book is called Fault Responsibility and Administrative Law in Late Babylonian Legal Texts. We came up with that title at a restaurant table somewhere in Berlin, um, and then we argued about it for a while. But <laughs> once we had made the agreement, we, we, we couldn't uh, agree to change it to anything that we liked. So um, it looks basically at administrative law during the Neo-Babylonian period, which is the time of the famous King Nebuchadnezzar, 
uh, and the first few Persian kings. And we argue that during this period, you start to see the first real evidence of something that you can call administrative law. And the temples were one of the chief administrative agencies of that time period. And they standardized things in such a way that they had an administrative system governed by rules and that punished people in a predictable way. So we consider that to be administrative law. Um, and it's a long sort of detailed argument, but um, we think it will change the way people look at that period and the way they understand the development of law um, during that period, which is really the 500s, mainly uh, BCE. Very interesting, because this leads right into our discussion today in some respects, understanding the Genesis story. I have to admit, and I just say this coming from my own background to getting to where you and the experts are on this, just trying to figure out the better questions and maybe some answers about what what the meaning of what's going on in Genesis is. I used to literally believe uh, in the fundamentalist approach, if you will, talking snake, uh, everything to the T was literal. And, um, and maybe there is some truth to the story of this happening where eventually I started to anthropomorphize and say, well, the snake is actually a man and the man is actually this guy or, you know, or some other explanation, which might be anachronistic. But um, I'm, I'm really interested in diving into the Genesis Garden of Eden story and it's all its intricacies, if you will, the, the details. Let's, let's journey into what is going on and maybe with your Babylonian expertise – and I've made that the background actually behind us. So whenever we're not on the screen, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that 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 Babylonian background might s help us define what's happening. So mm -hmm. tell us what's what's going on in Genesis. Well, I should say I got interested in, in this project on Genesis two and three because of the work I was doing on the Neo Babylonian period for that uh, most recent book, and I started to notice that there were documents where temple officials told some of their servants to guard certain plots of land in a way that seems similar to me um, to, to the uh, Genesis story. So I started to do more research on this and read the story more closely. And of course I was hoping to see parallels. And so I think I do see a lot of parallels between what's happening in Babylonia around this time period that I was talking about and what the author of the Genesis story is trying to say. But I think a good place to start for the Genesis story is to say, that at the beginning it says uh, no vegetation had grown on the earth yet and there was no man to work the ground and that's when God created um, the man and so on. But the key is there's no man to work the ground and then at the end of the story it says that God or Yahweh sent them out of the garden so that the man could work the ground. Hmm. So in a sense you can say the story is one giant etiology or explanation of how it came to be that men worked the ground to grow food to, to survive. Um, but in between that beginning and that end, there's a lot of stuff to unpack. So it sort of um, it sort of disguises itself. The story disguises itself as this giant etiology about agriculture. Um, but just a little tiny peek under the surface shows that it's mo about much more than that. And I think you're right. There is some truth to it in terms of how we understand the human condition uh, and things like that. So I think it helps to understand, first of all, though, it's a, it, it dresses itself up as a literary work explaining kind of the origins of agriculture. Um, but people generally don't remember it for that, of course. <laughs> so this, this is a fascinating point to bring up. You, you mentioned briefly, just went right past it. I was looking for parallels and I think I found some and you're mm -hmm. very cautious. I noticed this about academia. This is why I love you guys so much. Uh, you're very cautious to say, I know that for certainty, for a fact, you have a very good hunch and you come at it probabilistically, but are you, maybe just to get your opinion, do you think that many scholars were exploring intertextuality or possible uh, relationship, genetic relationship between this literature mm -hmm. and these times. Do you think they have parallelophobia? It's almost like they don't want to find the connections because if they do, what does this do to our narrative? Or, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying for everyone, but what are yeah. your personal thoughts on that? I tend to favor looking for parallels and I've been to lots of conferences and different lectures 
where people will stand up and say, I'm going to talk about parallels, but I want to be super cautious about it and say we shouldn't be caught up in what they call parallel mania and looking for parallels all the time. Um, and so I, I take your point that people can often be too cautious because if we act a little more boldly and point out these parallels more clearly, I think that pushes us forward in terms of thinking about what's going on in terms of cultural interaction and maybe some intertextuality. That Sometimes that's hard to pin down if, if an author is thinking about a certain text or a certain collection of texts as they're producing their own work. But I tend to favor and have been criticized for this, um, tend to favor looking for parallels and articulating them as clearly as we can. Um, so just for instance, there are a couple of texts uh, from this Neo-Babylonian time period I've talk I'm talking about where temple officials assign a certain kind of temple servant to guard an orchard. And it sounds to me very similar to what's going on in Genesis 3 where Yahweh who is running his sacred estate there in Eden. He seems to live in Eden and have his angels there in Eden. Um, and the garden is just part of Eden. And he assigns the man to guard the garden. The Hebrew word is shamar, which means to guard. And then the other verb that's used is a general word for work. So he's to work the garden, kind of take care of it, um, and guard it. Uh, and it's an orchard, it's a garden of trees. So we would call it an orchard. And I thought, you know, that sounds exactly like what's happening uh, with the Babylonian temples where they have lots of orchards and they need someone to guard them from thieves, from animals that can come in there and eat. Uh, and there are certain texts where these servants can eat from certain trees within the orchard, but cannot eat from other trees within the orchard. It depends on how full grown they are. Um, the full grown fruit producing trees are reserved for the temple. The younger trees that might be producing a little bit of fruit can be used by the servants. Um, and I think, uh, you know, where I'm going to go with this ultimately is to try to say that the author of the story is trying to portray Adam and Eve as this particular type of temple servant. Um, in Babylonia, the term for this type of servant was a shirku, which means given one or devoted one. So someone has given this person to the temple. They're not really a temple slave, but they are dependent on the temple for their sustenance, and they are certainly subject to the temple's authority. Um, but the temple can't buy and sell them as it could uh, regular chattel slaves. Um, but I think in the Garden of Eden story, Yahweh functions as, as the administrator of the sacred estate, which is like a temple estate. And Adam functions as one of his servants. Um, so I think there are a number of parallels that can be drawn out from making that particular connection. Um, and I've given some lectures on this and we're working on a book and I'm gonna try to make the argument stronger in the book. Um, but I, I'm being a little cautious about it in how I, in how I state it just because um, I don't have uh, time here necessarily to lay out all the evidence to try to convince viewers that I'm right about this. So I just want them to understand this is my take on it for now. And hopefully at some point I'll be able to lay out the evidence and then people can make up their own minds. Yeah, I'm excited about this. So a few foundational questions I'd love to ask you in particular. Are you on board with um, the idea that and it's probably consensus here. I'm just making the claim to get your personal professional mm -hmm. uh, estimation on this is, is Genesis and, and this Adam and Eve story about the first human. I mean, is this the myth about there were no humans before this, as lots of people will try to make the case, um, you know, this is the first man. Whereas there are some people popping up that are trying to say Adam is Israel or um, he's not the first man. Therefore, we don't have to deal with the problem of evolution. So they're always constantly trying to anachronistically deal with science and then try to justify it. So is Adam like the first man in human history, according to the Genesis myth? Wow. Okay. That's a good question. Uh, the reason I can't answer it super simply is that it seems to me at least, and I think to a number of other scholars that the whole story is made up out of at least two, if not three different stories. Mm -hmm. So I think there was an original creation story that didn't have the special trees and the talking snake and the disobedience. 
in it. But I think there was a story where Adam is created. I don't think it really calls him Adam. Adam is the word for man or human. So he's the man. He is created. His wife is created. Um, and I think the last statement in that story comes in chapter three, verse 20, where it says, and Adam named his wife Eve or the man named his wife Eve because she is the mother of all living. And I think it ends there. The original story probably ended there. So in that story, um, yes, uh, for whoever's writing that they're, yeah, I guess I could say in a way they're claiming, um, that Adam is the first human creature on earth, but, um, I'm a little hesitant to start saying that that's a ridiculous idea. I mean, because our conceptions of science and history come, po come partly from the Middle Ages and partly from after the Enlightenment. And to talk about history and science in post-Enlightenment terms within the context of an ancient society uh, is not exactly a, a neat, clean fit. Right. So, I mean, yes, an author was telling this story myth or saga about Adam being the first person. Um, and, you know, I don't think the person is necessarily trying to do history or to do science. They're telling what they think is an interesting story. Uh, and I don't know exactly why they're telling it or what they want to communicate with that. But at a surface level, yes, uh, the author's trying to say that Adam is the first person. And, um, you know, they, they don't, they don't know that they, they don't know what we know. And so, mm -hmm. We can judge them harshly for it, or we can treat them a little more charitably, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely take the charitable approach. I think that uh, letting people know the difference, though, is very important to know. Cosmology was different then. A lot of different things play a significant role. And uh, I love to educate people on that so, so that we would, you know, there's a lot of fundamentalists. <laughs> like I said, mm -hmm. I came out of that are extreme. And, you know, young earth, flat earth even, they go mm -hmm. so far. So it's like, eh, let's cut through that. Yeah, um, I, I, I just want to say... I agree. Um, I, to me, there are fundamentalists on both sides. There are the religious fundamentalists who say we have to take it literally um, or it's of no value to us. And there are the so-called, well, I would say maybe fundamentalists or extremists on the other side who mm -hmm. say if it doesn't match up with science, then it's of no value. And, right. and they say clearly it doesn't match up with science, so it's, it's not worth even thinking about or talking about. Um, so there's there are two extremes there and usually the truth is somewhere in the middle. And, you know, I think that's where our discussion will take place today. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on that. I love literature and these stories. They tell us a lot about us and how we thought and what we're trying to do. Um, real quick, two questions as we dive into this death. Um, it seems like the story, at least this part of the story, because if we look at like the documentary hypothesis or if you look at supplementary, whatever position you take that they're splicing narratives together this redactor and my question is is this trying to maybe tell us why we die mm -hmm. like this seems to be trying to explain the age-old question like why do we have to die yeah. and then you know what i mean i think it's something like that that's going on so james barr who taught at oxford and 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 then vanderbilt he's a british scholar passed away um you know 15 years ago now i think um he wrote a book in 92 um, I'm not gonna remember the name of it now, but his point was this story, like other stories from the ancient world are in a sense about why we die, but more specifically, they're about how we lost immortality or how we, I guess I should say why we don't have immortality. Mm -hmm. And so you have a number of these stories that talk about the ancient times, the early days when there was this slight chance where it looked like humans might be able to get immortality and then they don't, it slips through their fingers. You probably know the Gilgamesh story where he finds the plant of everlasting life and silly him, he doesn't eat it right away. He saves it, <laughs> you know, puts it in his boat, just takes a break from rowing or whatever. And, and um, some kind of reptile, uh, interestingly enough, comes along and, and steals the plant, drags it down to the bottom of the ocean where it will never be found again. And humanity lost out, you know, on its chance to, to gain immortality. And so he says, this story is being told in a somewhat different way, but ultimately it's explaining, like you said, why we die, why we're mortal, how we lost out at the very beginning of the world. 
Wow. Yeah. I love uh, looking at that, comparing them and stuff. And um, does, does your approach to Genesis, the way you're doing this with Babylon, does it help us maybe with dating? Mm-hmm. Uh, because we, we love to want to know when something was <laughs> written and people go, Oh, don't get me into that question. But it sounds like if they're mm-hmm. using this Neo Babylonian, if, if I could call it that uh, motif and we see it in this time frame, can that help us with dating Genesis? I hope so. Uh, I might have to be extra cautious on this point because dating <laughs> is, is a fraught question you know, we have these manuscripts with these stories and to try to date them is very difficult. And some people have made some good arguments about dating things linguistically. So that you look at the kind of Hebrew that's used in a given story and you might be able to say, well, that seems older than other texts that use a different kind of Hebrew. So books like Daniel uh, and Ezra and Nehemiah and Chronicles, they have very late Hebrew uh, in them. Other books, parts of Samuel and, and Kings, even parts of Genesis have older Hebrew, um, but it's hard to be conclusive using linguistic criteria in that way. I would like to think my work can help help us with dating this, this um, story. Now, one big issue has to do with whether the Garden of Eden story was written before or after the first creation story where it all happens in six days and then God rests on the seventh. So do Genesis two and three come before that chronologically in terms of composition or, or later. And I have believed for a long time that uh, the Garden of Eden story came first and then Genesis one from what we call the priestly source came second. Now I'm not so sure, um, <laughs> <laughs> partly because my own research and I've been reading other scholars who are saying the Garden of Eden story comes later and they make some very good arguments because they they try to show how the Garden of Eden story is reacting in certain ways to the priestly story. One example would be the priestly story says over and over that creation is good. God saw what he had created and it was good. And then the second thing that God says in the Garden of Eden story is that something is not good. It's not good for the man to be alone. And it almost sounds as if an author is sort of poking at the priestly story saying, wait, not everything is quite Uh, up to snuff here. Um, And there are certain things about creation that have to be treated with more nuance or something. So that debate is still playing out. Um, But one of the most recent efforts to talk about dating uh, came out in a book in 2018, Mark Smith, maybe you know him, he was at New York University for a while. And he says the sixth century or the 500 seems to him the best time. And he has his own reasons for that. And that's exactly where I would like to place it because it fits with the Neo-Babylonian stuff going on. Real quickly, this particular kind of temple servant I'm focused on, the Shirku, they become very prominent in that century. They are attested at other temples, even in Assyria, before that time. Um, And it could just be the fact that we don't have the kinds of evidence we would like from earlier times to show us that these temple servants were widespread and active uh, like they are later, but um, they're not attested a lot earlier. Like they're not attested in the old Babylonian period or the middle Babylonian period. Um, so I think, uh, I hope what I'm saying will have some bearing on dating, but we'll see. But yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> yeah. if they're using this motif as seriously as I think they are, then yes, we probably have to make it um, sometime in the sixth century. And that's going to, that could throw things throw a wrench into the whole discussion of the relationship between the two stories. Yeah. There's so many questions on dating and like for me that I'd love to further uh, maybe ask and probe with you on like, and I'll give you an example and I don't necessarily want to go there because there's so many details we can go into in the garden and get in this comparison, but simply put would be like, if this is sixth century BC, let's say um, then because there's a redactor that compiled multiple narratives, some may be way older, some maybe even, newer than that uh makes you really wonder when did the comp composition of the what we call the tanakh the torah mm-hmm. when did that actually ha- like when it was like okay you know we have the the, the bible stories about oh we found it uh, we we discovered it, and, and and people were thinking that's the whole tanakh but it makes me wonder like was it a fourth century finally mm-hmm. redactor who said hey we're putting all of this together 
makes me really scratch my head and wonder. I, that's all. So yeah, uh, if you want to comment, you can. I just didn't want to get you rabbit trailed on speculation because I know you have a lot of great things to discuss. Uh, just a quick comment is I think something like that is going on. The Dead Sea Scrolls come from the maybe 150 BC and later. So, um, you know, into the time of Jesus and so on. So some kind of redaction has happened by that point. So maybe fourth century, traditionally people said it was around the time of Ezra and maybe he had a hand in doing it, but it's hard to even date Ezra himself and his story. Um, but I would say, yes, I would agree. Something like that is going on. Um, late fifth, early fourth, maybe mid fourth century. Somebody's putting a lot of this stuff together. Thank you so much. All right. So you mentioned these temple uh, guards, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. these these vineyard guards and whatnot. And and if you would, can you tell us in some, I guess, poetic way, <laughs> what's going on over here with Adam and Eve? And then maybe like give us a parallel mm -hmm. to kind of connect the story in our heads, giving us a visual. Right. OK. Um, so in the Garden of Eden story, Adam well, we find out very little about what he's supposed to do. It just says he's supposed to work the garden and guard the garden. And I should start calling it an orchard because it's just, as far as we know, it only has trees in it. Um, so we would call that an orchard in our language. So he's working the orchard and guarding it. You would think he might have to do other things because in the Babylonian stuff, these temple servants, they have to do things like clearing away the debris before the garden, can, the orchard can be planted. They have to, of course, dig and plant some of the trees. They, uh, before that, they have to moisten the ground so they can dig into it. Then they have to also dig uh, branches off a main canal so it, there'll be a smaller canal running over toward their orchard. But all of that seems to be taken care of by Yahweh in the Genesis story because it says he plants the orchard. He causes the trees to spring up out of the ground. And there are rivers running out of Eden uh, that helped to water the orchard. And, and, and even before that, uh, before he creates the man, it says a mist was rising up uh, from the ground that watered the face of the earth. So it almost sounds like, to me at least, the author is thinking of these different steps that have to happen in order to plant an orchard. You have to moisten the ground, you have to plant the seeds, you have to get the trees to grow up, um, and you have to create an irrigation system to keep it watered because date, these are probably date palms. Uh, that was the most widespread cultivated tree that we know of uh, in Babylonia, at least at the time. And they require a lot of water. So irrigation is a big deal. So these things are taken care of by the God in the Babylonian texts. Um, they're often assigned to these temple servants, or they could be assigned to people I'm going to call temple gardeners who are at a higher status than the servants. So they have, they have a kind of profession. The servants can be told to do anything, you know, carry this barley from one place to another, watch these cattle for a while, help out in the orchards. Whereas the gardeners have a higher status and basically just do gardening and orchard work. Um, and sometimes they're the ones responsible for certain, especially special orchards, where they grow the fruit that will be offered to the gods during certain sacrifices. Um, so it seems to me part of Adam's job in the story is to take care of the garden because some of this food is reserved for the gods. I say gods plural, maybe I should say God singular, but then later in the story, Yahweh says, oh, look, the man has become like one of us. And he uses the plural. So, you can think of these other beings as angels or sub gods. Yahweh is clearly the chief God, but he has some kind of entourage or assembly that he is in control of. And I think um, one of the things that stands out about these temple servants from Babylonia is that they are not allowed to do certain things that the higher status folks were allowed to do. So there were parts of the temple precinct they could not enter. And if they did, they would get in big trouble. We have at least one text about a servant who entered a space he wasn't supposed to. They were also um, not to handle certain food or certain items that belong to the gods. And there are a couple cases where they seem to overstep their bounds. Um, one, like I said, entering sacred space that they weren't supposed to. Another one was learning to 
recite special incantations that they weren't supposed to know. Um, and another one was working in one of these special areas that produced fruit for the gods. They didn't want the servants getting too close to uh, this stuff that was earmarked for the gods. Hmm. So when Adam eats from the tree of knowledge and his and Eve, I would say the reader at that point understands these are temple servants. They're not supposed to overstep their bounds by eating from these, this special tree. They are stepping into territory reserved for the gods and, you know, partaking of stuff that's reserved for the gods. Um, and we even have texts from Babylonia where the servants are threatened with death should they do some of these things. Um, and the language I think is very similar uh, between Genesis and some of the Babylonian texts where it'll say on the day that you do this thing that you're not supposed to do, you will either die or you'll be punished in another way. And in Genesis, Yahweh says the same thing in chapter two, verse 17, on the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Um, so it sounds to me like one of these threats or warnings that you get issued to temple servants um, who are working in these orchards and in other places as well. So you asked me to kind of explain what's going on. That's yeah, yeah. Uh, an overview of, of, of how I see some of these parallels at work here. So those are some interesting parallels. And I feel like there's other details to the story. I don't know if they would be like a direct parallel uh, example. Let me point out a couple, maybe to get your two cents on it. Cause this is really fun. Um, Adam's made from dust from, from the dirt, if you will. And then he, you know, God forms him, even breathes his pneuma, his, his spirit or wind into him. And, and now he's a, a life or he's a, he's a living man and out of his side or his, from his rib, if you will, to be more direct as uh, Dr. Joshua Bowen. And uh, I had a couple Hebrew scholars come on that were like, it seems to imply that that seems to make the most sense. Not just that they're split in half as this like male, female, female figure that's cut in half, but coming directly from his rib. Cause we have other potential examples in the Mesopotamian world where um, from a certain body part, there's like a healing or something that comes from it, or, or I can't remember exactly the detail, but wh what do we do with these other details? Man mm -hmm. is created. Then you have Eve made from his side, etc. How do we p piece that into this? Right. Well, there I have to um, sort of step out of, out of my, um, particular world of parallels and say, I think the story is interacting with a number of things. It's interacting on the one hand with the mundane, mundane everyday orchard and garden work that these servants were involved in. But on the other hand, the story is interacting with mythic themes from other stories and from the culture itself. And so the creation of man from dust or from soil sounds a little bit like stories where humans are created from clay like they are in Atrahasis, the famous Babylonian creation story. And then they're mixed with some element from a God, sometimes with blood uh, from a God. I think that's in the Enuma Elish. And in Genesis 2, the soil or the clay is mixed with the breath of God to create the human. So uh, those details that you just mentioned don't really fit the whole uh, temple servant paradigm that I'm working with. Right. But I think the story is pulling from multiple sources and interacting with multiple ideas. Some are mythic and literary, we might say, and some are coming out of the world of temple operations. And he, the author is mixing these two together in a very interesting way, but we have to be attuned, I think, to both types of parallels. So this technically, and to put it into dumb, dumb terms for guys <laughs> like me, uh, if we were to put ourselves in, let's say, uh, uh, someone in Babylon that's an Israelite who is like breathing the culture, they know what the, what's going on. They're obviously in captivity, uh, whether they're captive or not. They're they're living in Babylon. They might even become comfortable there, and and they're participating in these possible functions that we see happening. This would be like reading. Um, uh, what's a good American example of something that we all know? It's it's a common trope within the mm -hmm. culture, so to speak. Well, so, something about Thanksgiving and the pilgrims. Right. Uh, it's a tradition we we know of, but it may not have really happened, you know, that way or something. 
Right. And that mythic combined with the temple that you're talking about here would have spoken far more to them than us trying to figure this out. So it's really interesting to see how you're piecing those together. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say the elements of the serpent, all of that is also within the mythic paradigm? Mostly, yes. Uh, so the serpent is the kind of animal you might expect in a sacred space. Some people worship serpents in the ancient Near East. Uh, we have objects from that have been found in temples by archaeologists that have serpents on them. Uh, the serpent was believed to have some sort of divine quality about it because it could shed its skin and it, and symbolically at least begin its life again as if it had multiple lives or a kind of immortality to it. So it had special religious or symbolic significance for them. So if you're going to have an animal turn up in Eden that's uh, extra wise or crafty or shrewd in some way, it would be a serpent or a snake. Um, but I think, yeah, I think that's connecting on to some of the mythic themes that the author interacts with in the yeah. story. I always wondered about the serpent. You know, so I, I don't know. I wish I could explain more about the serpent. Uh, and some early Christians thought the serpent was the good guy of the story. Uh, certain Gnostic groups yeah. thought that because he revealed secret knowledge that the humans didn't have. They didn't realize that if they ate from the tree of knowledge, they would become like gods knowing good and evil. And so the Gnostics, who are all into secret knowledge, of course, they think this is great. The serpent is spilling the beans and telling them the truth of the situation, whereas the creator God is trying to hide the truth uh, from them. I don't, I don't know if the ancient Hebrew author thought of it that way. That's actually hard for me to figure out. But, but yeah, these other Christian groups thought about it in those very terms. Especially when in the day you eat, you'll surely die. And if you take that literally, which you've mentioned before, that we're not certain, but it might mean that from the mm -hmm. temple uh, aspects you're discussing, the law saying not to do this in the day you do that, this is what will happen. But um, they don't die, and then they just get booted from immortality here from the tree of life, which I found is interesting. You have two trees. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, is that mythic, or is there some significance where you have divine trees and you have regular trees or something. Is there some aspect to that in the story that comes from the temple side? Yeah, it might. The only thing I can uh, put that together with is this idea that certain fruit trees in, on temple lands were reserved for uh, fruit to be offered to the gods. And so they usually, you know, I wish we had more evidence, but usually it seems to be the case. They wanted these higher status gardeners to take care of those trees. And the lower down temple servants would take care of orchards that might produce some fruit for the gods at sacrifices, but mostly would produce fruit to feed the temple personnel or that they could sell to make money. The temple was a major economic enterprise as well as a religious enterprise. So um, I would just add to this, this idea of the gods receiving fruit as part of their sacrifices. There's lots of evidence for that in Babylonia. They received animals that were sacrificed, but lots of different fruit products, especially dates. And in Genesis um, 3, when it says that God is walking around in the garden looking for the man while the man and the woman are hiding, that verb for walking around is used elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible at times of worship. Uh, and so I'm going to try to make the argument that God's walking around means he's there in the garden to get an offering uh, of fruit that the humans should have ready for him. And they don't, they've been doing other things <laughs> like um. eating from the wrong tree. So now they're hiding for multiple reasons. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the connection I would try to make there with the two trees. The tree of life was certainly an important symbol. I think in other cultures, the Egyptians talk about the tree of life and the Assyrians have artwork that seems to suggest they also had a concept of a tree of life that was sacred in some way. So it's, it's not an unusual or surprising to see it show up in biblical texts. The tree of knowledge doesn't seem to have any connection to any other tree we know about from other cultures. So the, that may be uh, an invention of the author of this story. But I do think there is something to this idea that the, certain fruit is reserved for the gods and certain fruit is not. Um, so I think that issue stands behind what's going on in the, in the Genesis story. What do we do with uh, 
crushing the serpent's head and and the uh, crawling on his belly, eating dust and uh, enmity between your seed and her seed. This thing. How, how do we understand this? I just want to make a brief comment. I've interviewed mm-hmm. Dr. Ronald Hendel, and uh, it was a really fun interview. He talked about the snakes. He mentioned some of the things you said in antiquity. They rejuvenate. They shed their skin, look brand new, but also they were feared. So mm-hmm. he thought maybe that, and, and maybe you could tag along or give your own perspective that they're stomping on these snakes because they're under them and they're afraid of them. And it's like, don't worry, your seed will win against them. Uh, how do you interpret this in your line of thinking? Yeah, I would go along with that. Um, it seems logical to me when the humans or when the woman first encounters the snake, she doesn't seem to be afraid of it. Whereas everybody knows that most people now when they encounter a snake get scared of it and run away. And that was certainly the case, I think in the middle East. Um, so again, the story is one big etiology on the surface and it has other smaller etiologies built into it. And I think this is one of them. It suggests, or it tries to say where the fear of snakes comes from. Uh, and it's, it's a kind of punishment on the snake itself. Humans will be trying to kill it all the time. And the best it can do is bite at the human's feet. Um, I know, uh, Christian theologians have seen a certain kind of symbolic value there, uh, with Christ crushing the head of, of the serpent who might symbolize Satan. And, um, from a historical perspective, that might be reading too much into it, um, from a more symbolic reinterpretive perspective, um, you know, there might, there might be value there. I, I just haven't thought about it that much. Yeah, I appreciate it. I just figured I'd get your two cents on that mm-hmm. in particular. Um, I really hope more people actually start to look at what you're doing, get the works. And when will be when will you be publishing the more in depth uh, mm-hmm. work that you're going to be that you mentioned? You've been giving us teasers, and I really <laughs> I want to look at this closer. Um, as soon as I can, I've had a lot of other things to do, and the pandemic didn't help. And then my mother. <laughs> very elderly mother had to come live with us for a while. Um, I do have an article that came out about a year ago in the journal of biblical literature called death in the garden of Eden. So if pe- people Google my name and then death in the garden of Eden, it should come up. Um, and in that article, I try to argue that the humans were not created as immortal beings. They were created as mortal and that the, the punishment was going to be, um, God just putting them to death, like a regular death sentence if they ate from the tree of knowledge. But I get a little bit into some of the things going on with the Neo-Babylonian temple servants. And I say it was very common for temple administrators to threaten their underlings, these servants with certain kinds of punishment, and then to change their mind and give them a different kind of punishment later. And I think the author's showing Yahweh in the Genesis story to be a typical temple administrator who threatens his servants with one thing and then punishes them with something else. So I think there's something, a connection there that's at work. Um, And I mentioned the article because it it's published and it touches on some of these issues a little bit. Um, I need to get that. I need to get the book manuscript done, hopefully within the next 12 months. And then it might take another, you know, eight to 10 to 12 months to actually come out and print after that. Um, I mentioned earlier, Adam is Israel. Have you ever looked into this hypothesis? A little bit. I've certainly read about it. Um, I can understand why people would say it. He's in a garden. He's where he's supposed to be, it seems like. And then he he gets kicked out and he's in a kind of exile. Mm -hmm. So Israel is in their land and then they do something wrong and they get kicked out into exile. Um, And there may be something to that. Um, I don't I I know that my students at, at the University of Texas tend to respond well to that idea. And so I'm happy to tell them about it, let them read scholars who promote that idea. Um, I'm a little less enthusiastic about it because I think the author is really trying to say something more about human nature in general um, and less about Israel as a nation. Although, you know, maybe there's a little bit uh, of allusion to Israel as a nation going on there. Um, I'm going to have to figure out what I want to say about it by the time this book comes out, I think, um, because people, people will want to know. Um, but I think the real issue is human nature because as humans, we are in many ways still like the animals. The, the, Adam and Eve were very much like animals before they ate from the tree in the story. They're naked. 
They don't really realize it. Um, and they don't have the knowledge that would separate them from the animal kingdom. And then they have, they gain this knowledge and they become, the story says, like gods, knowing good and evil. And I think as humans, we are this very bizarre mix of animal-like qualities and what you might call divine-like qualities. We can go to the moon. In fact, I just heard on the radio today, one of our space rovers for the first time reached the outer circle of the sun. Hmm. Um, that was reported, I guess, in the news last week. Um, but, you know, we, we, if you take away our three meals a day and our, you know, air conditioning, we'll turn into animals pretty quickly fighting each other for what scraps of food we can get. Um, so how do we, how do we think about our condition in that way? And what do we do about it? I think is part of what the story is trying to get at. Uh, and so it shows, um, that we're really dangerous now. We, we had our animal instincts previously. Once we get knowledge, we're really dangerous because we can do some awful things with that knowledge. We can do some really good things with that knowledge. So it's like nuclear power in a way, nuclear energy. It's super dangerous, super powerful, but super dangerous. And humans, once they acquire knowledge, become super powerful, but super dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the other stories, I think, show Yahweh or God trying to keep that human power in check. Like you have with the, with the Tower of Babel story, the humans are building a tower to the heavens and God can't have this going on. The humans cannot be allowed to reach the heavens. So he confuses the languages and they have to spread out and stop, stop building their tower. Um, so he's, he's trying to keep these uh, humans in check to some degree. Uh, is this the same source? Stories. So yes, is, it's, is Genesis six also the same source? Because it sounds to me, and I, I don't know if this mm -hmm. is the same source, but it sounds to me when I've, I was reading a, a couple different scholars and one of them that comes to mind because I've been recently engaging with some of the Christian apologists online is uh, uh, Ro, uh, uh, Michael Heiser. Um, Heiser takes this uh, approach. He's very open-minded to the, um, to the uh, having the, throne room idea there are many elohim different gods and such and the supreme is yahweh and but the apkalu that we find in this other mesopotamian mm -hmm. literature seem to be wanting to teach these teach knowledge if you can use the term that fruit that is forbidden that's going to teach you the knowledge of good and evil um and in that they're learning agriculture they're learning warfare they're learning things that make us very dangerous like you're talking about and of course, they're teaching these things, these sages, these Akalu, if you can call them that, I guess. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're divine ones or whatever. And in the Genesis narrative, here you have sons of God coming down, and they're they're definitely interacting with humans because they're having children with them. And and then boom, nothing but wickedness. Of course, there's a lot more to this that, mm -hmm. that I can't even touch on. Is this polemics? Is this <laughs> they get okay. God off the hook? There's all sorts <sighs> of different things, but I think it was Ron Hendel, whom you mentioned earlier, that wrote an article where I first saw this idea that the flood story in this source that we're talking about, the J source or the Yahweh source was brought onto the earth by God, partly to stop the wickedness that was generated by these demigods that were birthed by the human women who had mated with the gods. Um, so I think of course, this is a mythic representation of some, uh, well, Every ancient culture has to have a flood story. So for the Yahwist, this is how he gets to his flood story. He has the gods mating with human women and producing offspring um, that have too much power. So, yeah, I think that's a good point. I think, like you said, you have this um, intermixing of species and then you have utter wickedness. Um, and part of Genesis 6 is from this source, not all of it. Uh, other parts of it are from the priestly source. But yeah, um, the flood is in part a check on this human power uh, that that runs amok once it, you know, once this uh, interspecies mating happens. And there's so many things I'm certain that you and I could go into. One last comment, if I may, mm -hmm. on the uh, Adam is Israel uh, hypothesis is I've I personally saw it as sure I see elements of exile potentially here. But it's very anachronistic, in my opinion. Who are the authors? What are they writing? Of course, they're experiencing exile. So 
when you formulate a mythology that is going to talk about your origins, they're not secretly the way I've understood this. And I could be, uh, I could be straw manning the position mm -hmm. and I don't mean mm -hmm. to is that it sounded to me, the people I talked to, they think this is a secret story. This whole Genesis practically one through 11. Now they, oh. I, don't, I don't know if they divide it up into different sources, but the point okay. is they act like it's all a secret story of Israel going through its birth as a nation at Mount Sinai <laughs> notice there's so many already assumptions here but instead of it being abrahamic uh covenant it's uh, mount sinai it's the mosaic covenant and they're exiled out of the land and, they, and there's this constant issue here the flood is local so they they find ways to like you know that's how they interpret it and they make it all about a secret story about later israel's history that we see throughout some of the later literature that's the way they understood it. And I thought what a better way to explain this is these are, this is a mythology of origins mm -hmm. of, of man explaining our creation of why we're here. Why do we die? All of that stuff generally kind of a universalistic approach. And we find elements of the literature from the people who are writing this. It's like putting their thumbprint. Like if I write a story, you're going to go, Oh, okay. Derek, Derek wrote that. Derek definitely wrote that. Mm -hmm. We can tell. Cause he kept saying y'all he's from the <laughs> South, you know, or something. It's kind of like that in their motif, their way of writing how they're constantly okay. in exile. I don't know though. I could be wrong. What are your thoughts? That sounds very reasonable to me. I agree that it's a kind of universalist mythology about why we're here and how we got here and, and what we're doing. Because initially I said, it's this big ideology about agriculture. And so the author can't tell the story any other way. Eventually the man has to leave the orchard and start doing agriculture. And eventually he has to eat from the tree of knowledge because we know humans have a kind of knowledge that separates us from animals. So, you know, the story is going to end up there. Of course, he's going to get, have to leave the garden at some point. And that's where he's supposed to be. Ultimately, he's supposed to be outside the garden, working the ground. So if you compare him to Israel, Israel is not supposed to be an exile necessarily like the man is. So there are some disconnects. And I think, like I said, I would agree with you that it's universal to begin with. And I like your analogy to a thumbprint because these people probably are living in exile or have at least experienced it. Um, you're going to see elements of that showing up in the story because that's how they look at the world now, given the experiences that they've had. I should, let me just throw this in there. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned, um, dealing with Christian apologists. Um, I am Christian. I go to church on a regular basis and I find great meaning and value in the Bible, but I don't, for me at least, I don't necessarily need to have a lot of these stories or any of these stories in Genesis be historical in some sense. I think they're getting at bigger truths that were important for those people at that time. Um, and for me, scripture is foundational in terms of how I look at the world and how I understand human nature. And I think people in general have a very selfish streak in them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this author recognized that and to some extent is trying to explain why we have this selfish streak that we can't seem to get rid of. Am I as generous as I would like to be? No. Um, and I feel it around this time at Christmas time where everyone's asking me for money. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, part of me wants to give you some money and part of me really doesn't <laughs> because I want to spend it on myself. Um, so, you know, I don't know what Christian apologists are saying about this part of Genesis. That's not part of my world for whatever reason. Right. Um, but uh, I don't think it needs to be overdone on their part because I think something else is going on. I think that if there's a valuable lesson I've like learned, and it's already something I've been practicing, but it like solidifies, is to find that middle ground. A value literature, no matter where it's from, if it teaches a wisdom that we all know is a good practical practical application type thing we should apply, mm -hmm. I don't care. The golden rule, right? We might find this in outside literature that is not within the New Testament, yet it seems to be a teaching Jesus taught, right? And you go, oh, there are some people who go, it's true because Jesus said it. And it's like, well, hold on. Let's let's yeah, it's good what he said, but it's also good because we we all see that this is something that we should practice as humans. So when you get to Genesis and you go, did it literally historically happen exactly verbatim what it's saying and, and the way I've understood it? Some people have to have that, it seems. Mm -hmm. uh, they just can't imagine with the way they have their whole paradigm, it's a house of cards. So they got to have their cards up or else the whole thing falls in their head. For me, I value this literature. I'm not a Christian anymore. 
but that doesn't mean I haven't come to appreciate this literature for more of what it actually is rather than uh, trying to fit this really harmful, literalistic, uh, non-progressive <laughs> worldview around it where that the world has to be 7,000, all science is lying, and then mm -hmm. you get off into these conspiracies where you're not sending your children to the hospital because you're afraid some out there thing in your head. I, I'm going to radical position here when I say right. that. So I just want to say that as a non-Christian, I value it and I want others to as well for what it is. Mm -hmm. And it's valuable liter liter literature. So Right. And I don't think the authors ever intended it for it intended it for it to be read um as super literal in the way you know a lot of people do. Um and a lot I don't know. Some of that has to do with how we think about knowledge and um, certain ways of understanding where knowledge comes from. But, but you're right. Certain people have to have it be historical or it's value less for them. And I think that's unfortunate. Yeah, it is unfortunate, but you know, this is why I'm trying to educate more people. I have nothing against people who are Christian or believers or anything like that, even though I'm a skeptic, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I am openly against harmful fundamentalism. That is because I came from it. And um, I've grown to fall in love with these things. Reading scholars such as yourself and Handel and, you know, the list goes on, Mark Smith, uh, which I'll be interviewing him in February. Uh, I'm oh, excited great. to do that as well. Yeah, I love reading all of your literature because it makes me realize these weren't dummies, mm -hmm. number one. These were very... Uh, sophisticated authors who knew what they were doing, especially by the time you get to a redactor who's trying to yeah. fit some of these stories that don't uh, necessarily go together. He did a good, you know, it's a he, obviously. Yeah. I, I'd be shocked to find out a female redactor was involved. <laughs> but yeah, I love learning our past and our history. And so Dr. Wells, if I could, what, what do you have upcoming? Let's plug you on our way out. And okay. <laughs> uh, what do you have coming up? Well, apart from this book project, um, I'm working on uh, with four other scholars on the Erdman's Handbook of the Pentateuch, uh, but that'll be a couple years probably in coming out. Um, and then my big long-term project is working on litigation documents. I'm still interested in this question of justice and le the legal system and how they handled legal disputes and how they tried to decide what they thought was right and fair. So I'm gathering trial records from lots of different time periods from the ancient Middle East and trying to record their linguistic features and their legal features in a big database that hopefully I can make available to people so they can search it. But uh, at least I'm, I'm hoping at least one book will come out of that project, but I'm, I'm uh, I've been interested in litigation since my dissertation. So that's been a lo very long term project I'm working on. Um, oh, I should plug this. Um, if, if you, uh, let's see, if you search for me and this phrase, on the beds of a woman, <laughs> don't put all that in quotes, Bruce Wells, on the beds of a woman. <laughs> uh, um, there's an article where I, I uh, look at the, the texts in Leviticus on same-sex relations between men, and I give what I think is a very different view of those, and I basically say, they're arguing um, that, you, that you shouldn't, if you're a man, you shouldn't have sex with another married man. Uh, because the phrase is, you shall not have sex with a man on the beds of a woman, which has been translated usually, you shall not have sex with a man as one lies with a woman. Um, so several people have told me they like that, that article. It came out in a collection of essays I have around here somewhere anyway. Um, so if you go look for that, um, that'll be interesting to people as well. I think, I think so too. Um, I'll try and search it and put it in the description of the video when I go to launch it so they don't have to search. Okay. Make okay. their job a little easier. Yeah. This reminded me in a sense of Eden Dershowitz, uh, where oh, yeah. he, had, mm -hmm. he has something, um, I don't know if this is the exact same location that you're dealing with, but I suspect it's in that area. Yeah. It's but, the uh, same texts. We have a slightly different take, but we both sort of end up making the same conclusion that that um it wasn't uh, it wasn't a total ban on male same-sex relations initially 
but it, but later it came to be read that way. Interesting. Yeah. Times change things. And we mm-hmm. have clear implications of that within the law. Israelites could own their own people. Uh, and then mm-hmm. eventually that's banned. And, and depending on where you're looking at in the law. So uh, you're also, I believe you were the professor for Jay Caballero, which I've had on the channel as well. Jay's a good friend and lawyer. So if I'm, if I'm ever in trouble down in Texas, I know who to call. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I call. I'm calling Jay as well. Yeah. He's, <laughs> And Jay, if you're listening, get cracking on your dissertation. You have another chapter to finish. There, Jay, Jay, what are we going to do here? <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bruce Wells, ladies and gentlemen, the Garden of Eden. There's a lot more than what meets the eye. And many scholars are jabbing back and forth, uh, disputing this issue all the time. Go check out his works. Get up to speed on the arguments and check out what's going on there as I continue to do so here at Myth Vision. Thank you, Dr. Wells. Thank you, Derek. And never forget, ladies and gentlemen, we are Myth Vision. <laughs>